Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, guys. So, uh, Kevin on the Fit United podcast, I've got Tia Hill here with me today. How's it going? Good, thanks. <laughs> Happy to have you. Obviously, we're doing this remotely. We had to push this back uh, a couple times, but I'm glad we're able to do it now. But of course, given uh, the time that we're in, we have to do this remotely. <laughs> yes. So don't be surprised if you hear my small children running around behind me <laughs> at times. <laughs> and I told your husband, Mike, uh, that, you know, you, maybe you were concerned about that. But I think that's part of the fun is that, uh, you know, we get the family in there too. So why not, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So kind of an interesting time right now. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we would normally have done this in person, which is generally how I like to do these things. But uh, we are in the times of COVID-19. So it's kind of the setting for what's happening right now. Um, how is your family handling all of that right now? Um, we're doing pretty well. Uh, yeah. We've stayed healthy so far. I think the hardest part is not seeing each of our sets of parents. Mm, I see. And uh, Mike's parents actually were vacationing in Arizona when they got the order t for all Canadians to come home. So they're self-isolating right now and they're in their 70s as well. So, oh my goodness. Uh, you know, we've been uh, getting groceries for them, uh, that kind of thing. Um, so I think for us, it's, it's just more of all of a sudden getting used to being stuck at home altogether with, uh, you know, three, three young kids. It's definitely right. an adjustment. Mm -hmm. And then also working from home as well is, is uh, new to us. Yeah. Yeah. So the good thing is, though, like you were saying earlier before we hit record was you can do work from home. Can Mike also do work from home? Yes. So he brought home his work computer and we've set up a desk area in our bedroom so that mm. we can lock the door when we need to. Uh, <laughs> lock yeah, so, the kids, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. He's finding it hard to manage uh, people that he works with, you know, giving them different mm. things to do. But, um, you know, that's just growing pains. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, it's certainly an adjustment for everybody. And of course, as you know, I'm here in the gym and uh, we have a closed gym, but I can come in here and still kind of do this stuff. Uh, if you can call it work, <laughs> I guess I'm working, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I like to tell everybody how uh, myself and the guest uh, have met, uh, right? And how you got to be on the show. So we met at Orange Theory a couple of years ago um, when I first started there. I can't remember when I started to see you regularly, but I know you're a regular at the 650 classes right? yes yeah every Tuesday morning <laughs> every Tuesday morning right and yeah. so that's where I would see you and I think only when I got switched over to Tuesday mornings that's when I started to see you, obviously every week yes um and so that's how we met um also your husband Mike uh, you recommended him to be a client of mine here at yes. Iron Alley and so he's been training with me for quite a few months now and uh, he's seen a lot of progress so really thrilled about that how's he feeling now that he's not able to come and work out though uh, well, I think he's a little uh, frustrated. He's been going yeah. for runs, but mm -hmm. I can already tell that like he he needs that me time, and mm -hmm. he likes to feel like he's working on himself. And mm -hmm. you always were able to come up with some good ideas for him, which he isn't necessarily able to do on his own. So right. he's missing it. Gotcha. Well, you know what? Let's maybe we'll have that conversation later, and uh, I can maybe program something for Mike and for you guys to do at home outside of your Orange Theory stuff. How about that? That would be cool. I'm sure both of us would appreciate that. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, so that's how we met. And um, now I just wanted to talk about you a little bit because I know you have a bit of an interesting story. Um, just the thing is, it's funny when, we, when I meet people at Orange Theory, it's very hard to really connect with you other than, you know, in between sets. I can say, okay, good job. Mm -hmm way to work or, you know, or even before class, but even in the mornings, uh, they are back to back classes. So I can't even really interact with you before or after class. Right. Um, but so I've, I've known you for a couple of years now and um, I just kind of want to learn more, a little bit more about you and uh, you know, yeah. So uh, I like to go right from the very beginning of life. Um, so as grow, as you grew up, um, you know, even up to now, who are kind of your bigger in, biggest influences in your life? Okay. Um, well, um, I, you haven't mentioned this yet, but I actually am an amputee mm. and I've been this way since birth. So yeah. I was born with a condition called proximal femoral focal deficiency. Okay. Um, okay. And so uh, essentially I'm missing the whole top part of my left leg. So when I was one, they amputated my foot so that I could start wearing a prosthetic leg and learning to walk. Um, 
And so kind of going back to your influences uh, mm -hmm. question, there's sort of three. My parents would be the first two um, because I have a younger brother who's able-bodied mm -hmm. and they always treated us exactly the same growing up. So I never really considered myself disabled. Yeah. I didn't even know that I walked with a limp or anything like that until, you know, I, I noticed people staring at me and I was kind of like, well, I've got pants on right now. So why are they looking at me? And then I eventually realized that I I do walk differently. Um, but because of them, I, I definitely didn't feel any different than an able-bodied person. And then the other person would be Terry Fox. Um, mm. I was born in 1981, and I think that's right around when he had to finish his run. And so um, when I came out, my mom, well, they were both surprised that I had this uh, issue. But my mom was like, well, you know, if Terry Fox just you know, had his run and inspired so many people. Like, you know, I'm sure my daughter can do amazing things in her life too. Sure. So I did think of him when I had to do things like run at school or, or that kind of thing, where I was like, you know what, you know, he can do it. I can do it as well. That's really cool. Um, that's amazing. And uh, I was going to get to that and I'm glad that you brought it up. Um, that was something that, um, of course, perhaps, I don't know if it's a discomfort thing, even for me, but how do you ask somebody about that? Right. Yes. And so, um, so you, it was from birth, essentially, you were saying Yeah. you had this condition. Yeah. So how was that growing up? And I guess we can kind of go right into it is that how was that experience growing up? Like you said, uh, your parents treated you as if, you know, there was, it was no different. Um, but, uh, I would imagine growing up with peers and things that that could have been a tough thing to deal with. Now, was it for you? Um, in a, a couple ways. Yeah. So I definitely did notice that at things like gym class, mm -hmm. I was behind. And uh, I remember I had a running race and I was way behind somebody and I didn't realize that my leg made me slower like that. Uh, so something like a skating field trip at school, I never looked forward to and I hated those just because I could never figure out how to skate. And uh, when we started track and field at school, I remember my teacher was like, well, you know, Tia, you can participate if you want, or you can help me rake the long jump pit. So in the end, that was my job was to rake the long jump pit. Um, okay. So th little things like that. And I would even actually like, you know, walk home from school and there would be teachers would stop on their way home and be like, you know, do you want to ride home? And I'd be like, well, no, I can walk home. That's fine. You know, so <laughs> I didn't feel that different, but there were definitely a few things. I think the hardest thing for me was probably when I became a teenager and people yeah. started dating. That was sort of the worst of it because I felt that it was, you know, much harder to get a boyfriend, like who wanted to date the girl with one leg, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, now looking back, it's like, why was I interested in high school boys anyway? You know, but <laughs> at That's the time, just, that was a big deal. <laughs> of course it was. That's just growing up, right? That's just growing up. Yeah. Um, that's really interesting you say that uh, because, again, me not having have experiencing what you experience, um, it's hard for me to empathize. And for, perhaps I'm going to ask you a question that will completely be off base. But um, for example, when you said your teachers were, were, would drive by and they'd see you walk in and they'd offer a ride. And of course, you're, in your mind, you're thinking, I'm, I'm walking home. I'm, it's all good. Yeah. In their, perhaps in their mind, it's very well-meaning. But yes. how did you perceive that? Um, either growing up or even now, if people were to ask you, like let's say as a coach, um, if I were to say, hey, Tia, um, you know, do you need an option for this or that or whatever? Almost treating you differently, um, I think, is I guess what I'm getting at. Um, and it's it, it depends on you and how you receive it, I guess, because it could be negatively perceived or positive. I'm not sure. But so in that instance where you were being asked by a teacher, like, can I get a ride or you know, would you like a ride home? How did you perceive that? Uh, I understood that it was coming from a good place. Mm -hmm. And I guess I just maybe felt a little bit flattered, like that was nice of them to care about me like that. Um, most of the time I said no, unless it was raining or snowing, then I was like, might as well take advantage. You know? <laughs> like anyone um, would anyway, right? <laughs> yes. But I, I definitely did like it when people approached me and asked me questions. It, mm -hmm. I felt that the staring was what I really didn't like. Like I... I still at swimming pools feel self-conscious because when I was little, that's when all of the kids would just stare at me when I was in my bathing suit and my swimming leg. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I definitely preferred that. Um, but I, I wasn't often offended. Um, I know there was actually one time at Orange Theory where one of the coaches offered me 
um, a modification. And I was like, well, you know, she should know I can do plank totally fine. Like, you know, cause I guess I just was like, well, In your I mind. wanted them to know I can still do lots of things, yeah, but, yeah. um, you know, I wasn't that offended. Okay. And I think I'll be, I'll really be honest with you, uh, in terms of this, uh, I didn't know how to approach that with you. Even then when I was writing out questions, I didn't know how to ask her, you know, to bring that up because, um, it can be a touchy subject for many people. And obviously if you've been dealing with it, with it all your life, so you kind of perhaps have built up, you know, perhaps a thick skin or how to deal with it in your own way and keep it positive. Um, but how could I have, and I think this is more of a learning thing for me, how could I have approached that better, not knowing how to approach it? You know, someone, you know, seeing something like that, because what I didn't want to do as a coach was to treat you any differently, right? right? If you needed an option, you would come to me, right? Yeah. And things like that. And so yeah. how, how, how could that have been better? This is more of a learning or a growth thing for me. What do you think? I think actually you handled it pretty well because, uh, you know, at Orange Theory anyway, they do offer different modifications mm -hmm. and um, I felt pretty comfortable with you right away. So if there had been something where I was just like, you know, I don't know what to do here. I was comfortable mm -hmm. enough to ask you. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple of people that I haven't found I'm comfortable with um, coaches there. So I think mm -hmm. it's just maybe the way that you are with uh, your clients in general so I don't think really it could have been improved upon um yeah so you know you're you're doing a good job and it's, I appreciate that um and I think you have brought it up a couple times which is mm. good as well because it made me feel like you were um thinking about what I was able to do and so mm. I appreciated that you asked about it yeah no thank you and uh, really I think um, for me I always try to be uh to sh to show empathy in whatever situation that may be before I make any action or decision. And this was just one for me that I just didn't really understand. And I think I'm glad that we, you and I are able to talk a little bit about it now, whether it's with you or with other people that I can approach that in, in, in a much better way. So <laughs> I, I want to, I, I want to go back a little bit now though, to uh, your teenage years, like you were saying, that was kind of a challenging time for you. Um, did you, was there ever a point that it was so difficult that you didn't even you know, want to interact with your friends or with, with people? Did it ever get to that point? Um, it did a little bit, just, um, you know, at like house parties in high mm -hmm. school where eventually some people would kind of wander off together. <laughs> um, the first few times that happened involved my friends. And okay. so I kind of felt like I was by myself a little bit. And mm -hmm. so in the end, I would just pick and choose and be like, you know what, just because my friends are going to this party, I don't have to go. If it's going to upset me, I'm just not going to bother. Yeah. Um, so something like that. Yes, I definitely just chose not to go. Yeah. And the other thing was like, I, I realized my strengths. So I was actually a very strong student at school. So um, I found that if I worked on what I knew that I could excel in, mm -hmm. then at least there were other parts of my life that I was fully in control of and that I could be proud of. So by the grade 12, it was like, well, you know what? Like, I don't have a boyfriend, but I'm one of the top students in the school. So Yeah. yeah. And you were able to focus your energy elsewhere, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I love that you, bring, you, you, you mentioned that because I think uh, for many of us, and, and I say this about myself, to be honest, is that I was so distracted. <laughs> <laughs> in high school um and for the exact same reasons that uh, you had just mentioned that you know like as a teenager um you know you get distracted and even outside of high school um I was too busy thinking about girls rather than you know my career path and honestly I don't I don't regret anything I just think that I could have now in of course in hindsight it's 2020 but I could have done things way better so that I could have focused on myself and not been so worried about the dating part of my life and you know I think that speaks a lot more to perhaps uh, the, sh you know, the things that I was insecure about, right? Mm -hmm. Perhaps that was your insecurity. And whereas for me, maybe it was, you know, acceptance of, you know, the female or just, you know, you know, being friends with a girl. I, I could not talk to a girl if you forced me to, if you stood me right in front of somebody, it was like the hardest thing in the world for me. Uh. <laughs> and, so, and so that took a lot of growth to get out of that situation or to feel that way. Um, but at the end of the day, it was just insecurities, right? And that's right. how we approach them. Yeah. And so, so at what point did you feel like, so you were focusing on school and you were, you know, one of the top students, as you said, um, how did that transition when you went into university and uh, post-secondary? 
Um, university was great. Yeah. Um, I ended up going to University of Victoria and I lived in residence for my first year. Mm. And uh, I made a lot of good girlfriends there. And um, in that first year, you know, some of them had boyfriends, some of them didn't. But the people that did have boyfriends, a lot of them were out of town. So we just all kind of like did our own thing. And it, we had a lot of fun together. And I actually ended up really not thinking too much about the boys after that like they were obviously guys that I was like well you're cute or I have a crush on you but I didn't yeah. really overthink things anymore mm -hmm. I think just because I was really happy with where I was in my life and happy with my friend situation and I mm -hmm. didn't feel left out so I just kind of uh, went with the flow a lot more than um, obsessing over things <laughs> <laughs> now were you at UVic for all four years or five years yes, whatever it was four years. Okay. Oh, okay four years yeah. um, and you stayed on res just for the first year Yes, and then for the, after that, I moved out into a house with a couple oh, of I the see. friends oh, that I, I met see. in Res. Okay, which is essentially, I guess, with, I would I would consider that the same thing because for me, I went to SFU and I could have stayed on Res, but I also could just drive there. I was twenty minutes away, so I just commuted to school. So I never had that full university experience. Well, right? it was so fun. Like yeah. I highly recommend it. When when my kids are old enough, I'm definitely going to encourage them to live in Res. Yeah, go do your yeah. thing. Grow up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll see you in a year, no, in a yeah. semester. Um, no, and I think, and, and uh, um, I'm, yeah, so when I reflect back on my, my kind of post-secondary career, uh, that was probably one thing I wish I had done, because I, I think it really forces you to grow up. Yeah, right? it does. Yeah. But it is expensive, so I know not every family can afford it. Um, mm -hmm. I was lucky that my parents could. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you went to UVic, you did four years now. Um, what did you major in? Because I know, I'm, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you have to get a master's to teach in high school, yes? Uh, right? You don't have to get a master's to teach. No, okay. I do have okay. a master's, but I okay. got that after. Um, oh, so my major was in math and then my minor was in physics. In physics. Okay. Yeah. Was there any, I mean, you were probably just very, were you very strong in math? And, yes. Okay. Yeah. And then physics, how did that tie into it? Well, the, um, when you, I knew that I wanted to be a teacher, yeah. even just going into university. And um, I knew that if you had two teachable areas, that looked better than just one. Mm, so my dad suggested that I take physics as well because physics is very closely related to math. Mm, okay. So what is the, what is the, I guess, progression? So you get your undergrad and then you said you don't need to have a master's to teach. Do you no. need to do anything else? Yes, you do need to do um, what's called your teaching certification. Okay. So it's different for elementary and secondary a little bit, but for secondary, you have another full year. Okay. where you have to do a practicum and you have to do coursework. And then after that, you're certified to teach. I see. I see. Yeah. So you went and did that. Um, did you, you said you did the master's after, had you come back home and then decide I'm going to go back or for master's or where did you do your master's? Yes. So I did that and I actually started teaching and then I, um, when you're a teacher, you start off pretty low on the pay scale. And so um, I realized then that if I wanted to earn more money, I needed to do my master's. So then I went to UBC and I did that there. I see. I see. Yeah. yeah um, back in my banking days, I remember um, uh, there was a teacher that, that came to me. And actually, I forgot his name, but I'm sure you might know him because this was in South Surrey. Um, oh. Yeah. And I'm not sure what school it was now. But anyway, and I totally forgot his name. Anyway, so like you said, as a, when you start out as a teacher, you kind of have to either, you know, upgrade your, your education or I think it's by tenure as well, right? It changes, right? Yeah, every year you have experience, you move okay. up on the pay scale. I see. And then does it cap out? You don't have to tell me how much, but it caps out after a certain amount of years, right? Yes, I think it's 10 years now that it caps out. So oh, now I'm at the very top of the pay scale. <laughs> Woohoo! So yeah, you're there. I know. <laughs> now, <laughs> now did, does, does getting a master's get you to that, pay, to, that, to that top? Or like if you had an undergrad and continue to teach, would you ever get to that top of the pay grade? No, you wouldn't. So oh, your, okay. your education, it's called level six as a master's. That's the top. And so I even see. if you did get your 10 years, if you're not a level six, you're not getting the highest. I amount. see. I see. And honestly, um, and I don't, I'm going to get your opinion on this now, but uh, would you, would you argue that teachers are underpaid for what they do, regardless of whether it's secondary or, or I would education? argue for <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> The amount of take-home work that I have, yeah. it's, uh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So if you were to do it on an hourly basis, right? 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, it would be definitely. And so I, and I, and I strongly believe in this whenever I see, you know, like, oh, the teachers union, they're, they're advocating for, you know, uh, pay, pay increase and things like that. I don't even think that those changes are even keeping up with inflation a lot of the time. No, they're not. Um, not at all. <laughs> right. So anyway, um, where is that right now? Like, I'm just uh, now this is just out of my pure curiosity. Where is that right now? Like, was there a, a, like an agreement like last year or two years ago? I can't remember. Uh, no, they actually just announced one this week. So oh, this week? Con- yeah, <laughs> our contract ended actually in June last year. And okay. so we've been working this year without a new contract. I and uh, they finally came up with an offer and we haven't ratified it yet um but it's they're strongly encouraging us to say yes so say yes no that's really cool i know Mm -hmm. um so little known fact about me i used to be an english teacher so i I, not not as a obviously an elementary or a post or secondary but um I got this uh, teaching certificate. It was called TEFL. I don't know if you're familiar. Okay, yeah, I've heard English as a foreign language. Mm -hmm. And um, so I can't remember how much I got paid. This was quite a few years ago now. But uh, same thing. I was kind of like, you know, at what point do I, you know, do you get a kind of a pay grade? And this was our pay increase. And this was uh, maybe a second year in. But you're right about the take-home work. You never really account for that. You think, okay, well, you're in, you know, you start at 8.30, you're done at 2.30 or 3, and then that's it. But that's not really the case. No. (laughs) It's not. <laughs> so take me through the day, a day in the life of a secondary teacher, right? Like from lesson planning or how does that all, how does that all work? Okay. So um, I, first of all, I do teach math and the way that it works in secondary is that um, we're semestered. So in one semester, we would teach four out of four blocks a day. In the second semester, we would teach three out of four blocks a day, mm-hmm. meaning that you would get one block of prep. Per day, I see, I see. and that's seventy minutes at our school. Okay. So the, between the semesters, it's very different because in the semester that you don't have your prep, you really don't have time to do very much uh, within the school day. Mm. So for me, because I've taught these courses before, I do have my lessons ready to go, uh, and I do have my unit plans and lesson plans. Um, However, I still like to kind of tweak things every year. And then the curriculum also recently changed. So we are having to make new units within a course. Okay. So I just bring that up because now that I'm experienced, there isn't too much to do on the the pre-planning side. It's Mm -hmm. more the marking side as well as answering emails. Uh, I'm also the math, one of the math department heads at our school. So Um, I get paid a little bit more money for that, but then I have to sort of be the go-to person for all of the math teachers. I see. Uh, and then we have to go to extra meetings as well. And we have to come up with department goals and do, okay. um, in charge of buying supplies for a department and all of that kind of stuff. Okay. So I would say that, uh, I personally, I get to school at seven fifteen, but that's usually to work out ahead of time. <laughs> Uh, and then I stay until about four o'clock. So then I've taught either my three or my four classes. I've done some photocopying for the next day. Uh, and then at home, I usually have at least one more hour of work, uh, after the kids go to bed. However, if I've just given a big test, then I, that adds to my workload because I don't do multiple choice tests. I do written tests. So I really have to go through the questions to give part marks and things like that. Now, multiple choice. I mean, that's interesting. You say that because um, it just all all I can see are bubbles in my head and pencils. <laughs> Scantron. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what, was that, is that just a preference of you as a teacher to not have uh, multiple choice? Uh, it is a preference, although yeah. the way that the curriculum is these days is we want students to elaborate on their answers a lot more. Mm. We want them to show their thinking, mm, and a lot of times we want a written explanation to I go see. with their math work so multiple choice doesn't really lend itself to that too well right no you couldn't really show your work no (laughs) all i can hear is my teacher saying show your work show your work oh (laughs) man but if i just know the answer do i have to tell you how i got (laughs) it no we need to see your process (laughs) yeah and and you know what i think that's probably growing up that was probably one of my challenges and math was not one of my strong points i know weird right because i'm asian (laughs) (laughs) Um, no but um but yeah i know it was just one of those things i think that i I probably could have spent more time on um could you i I guess you kind of mentioned it earlier but 
how different has education changed? How much has it changed since um, you and I went to school? Because we're about the same age. Because back then it was Scantrons and there was no emailing teachers or I guess now perhaps going on to online you know, education. How has that changed your work day? Because now you can, you can do emails and things like that. Has it added more work to, your, to, your, you know, to what you need to do or has it made it easier for you? Would you say? Um, I think it's made it easier in a sense because back when parents used to leave us messages, you know, you'd have right. to take the time to go to your voicemail, which on my cell phone is just like, who leaves a voicemail these <laughs> days, you know? So um, there was that hassle of checking the voicemail and then phoning them back. And right. these days it's a lot quicker to just type back a quick email. Mm. Um, when I was in school, there were provincial exams. Mm, uh, and so, <laughs> yeah. And so the teacher really, a lot of times taught to those exams. Mm. And now we don't have provincial exams anymore. We have, you know, a final that's worth 20%. But even then where I can see within the next few years, we might be getting away from any sort of um, assessment like that. And okay. really the whole point these days is to show your growth. So okay. if I give a test in February and someone doesn't do well on it, but then in June they think, you know what, Mrs. Hill, I have really studied this. I really think I can do better Then I'm supposed to give them the opportunity to, you know, maybe have a different version, but, they can show me what they've learned and I should be counting that better mark for them. So uh, definitely things have changed a lot. I would say mostly in the assessment side of things. I see. So this standardized testing, like you were saying provincials, I think I, I like to take three out of the four that I had to take at the time. Um, they're, uh, the education system is moving away from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not in all provinces. Some provinces still have it, but in our province, there aren't any. And there is something now called a literacy and numeracy assessment for grade tens. Um, but it's, again, it's more of a pass fail where they're just looking to see where the student is at, I as see. opposed to you failed this test, you have to do it again. I see. So then how would you take, I guess, I guess grades still count though. Like if you were to go and apply for university, they still look at, you know, do you, they still look at your A's and B's and C's? They do now. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. um, Grade eight and nine now are only letter grades and not percentages. I see. 10 to 12 are percentages. And actually a lot of universities are also looking at grade 11 marks as well these okay. days. Okay. Now you teach at Elgin, is that right? Yes. Elgin. Okay. So I mentioned to you when I was messaging you the other day that uh, we're going to be hopefully moving to South Surrey in a little while. Mm -hmm. And so we looked at uh, the catchment for where we live and I believe oh, okay. we fall into Elgin. So depending okay. if you're still there, <laughs> uh, my son Cruz may be uh, in one of your classes, but uh, yeah. we've got a long ways yet. He's not even one yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, what grades do you teach? Um, I teach anywhere from grades nine to 12. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you do do a whole range and yeah. both math and physics or do you do other things too? No, actually um, we have a teacher at our school that has a PhD in physics. Um, mm -hmm. So he teaches most of the physics and then uh, some of the other science teachers do. So I just, after I graduated with physics, I realized I actually liked math a whole lot better. And so <laughs> I, I'm just math. <laughs> oh, you're just straight up math. I yeah. love it. I love it. <laughs> And that's okay too, right? To focus on one thing. Cause I know certain teachers when they start their education careers, I don't know if this was the case for you, but they kind of get you to do one other, you know, subject that's not your main focus, like math. Did, they, did you start that way too? I had to teach career and personal planning uh, um, cap. for one semester. Yes. Cap. Love <laughs> cap. Oh man. I love cap. It was so easy. Yeah, I know. And it's, um, oh my I think a lot of times it's more like somebody has a block in their schedule that mm -hmm. they need to fill it. So it's, it's not like, Oh, it would be good for Tia to teach this subject. She doesn't know. It's just like, Oh, okay. Well, this fits together the best for her. So gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Now question for you on this. And I know, uh, again, back when we went to school, this was very almost taboo, but what is it like in the secondary school system in, in terms of sex, sex education? Is that, is there any focus on that now? Has that changed at all? Um, I'm probably the wrong person to ask <laughs> just because I am just in my little math world. But yeah, uh, yeah so there is um, definitely still a health education. Mm -hmm. And um, there are courses now called career life education. So they, they it's similar to CAP, but obviously um, with a 
new curriculum focus. Um, so yes, they still do learn about it, but uh, I personally do not teach it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just curious because I just remember having to watch a video. I don't know if you remember this back in the day. <laughs> There was a video that just, you know, they said, okay, everyone's got to watch it. I think it was a great seven too. So it was oh, yeah. early. Yeah. <laughs> I think I watched um, the same video. <laughs> yeah. I think we were all forced to <laughs> sit there awkwardly. But anyway, I, th I hope that's something that's, um, you know, obviously developed and has, is not so taboo anymore. At least that's my view, um, mm -hmm. right? To make those things taboo probably makes, I don't know, just complicates things growing up. Um, so I never asked you this, but how did you decide that you wanted to be a teacher? Did you know you wanted to be a teacher just growing up? Was this kind of a one straight path for you or were you contemplating other careers as well? It was one straight path. Actually, my mom was a grade one teacher. Mm -hmm. So uh, obviously I saw her doing her work growing up and it just was always in my mind that I wanted to be a teacher. Okay. Uh, but when I asked my parents, I said, well, what grade do you think I should teach? And they said that they didn't think I had patience for the younger kids. So that I should be a high school teacher. So oh, nice. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, and did you have a preference? I don't know if I, you know, if I just missed this, but did you have a preference? Did you, you just want it to be high school or did you think about doing elementary as well or no? I think at first I, I yeah. would have been fine with something like grade seven, mm -hmm. but uh, once I started the secondary education program, I was like, yep, yeah, this seems like it's the right home for me. That's so. where you wanted to go. Um, yeah. I think you're very fortunate that way uh, that you were able to figure that out early on. To, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people who have these, uh, you know, they know what their career path is. You can focus on it and kind of, you know, gain your tenure that way. But then there's people like me that's changed three careers now since... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I started right. So yeah. I think you're very fortunate that way that you want to stick to one career. I know, and even you know, for our students, they have to sort of pick their courses uh, at the end of grade ten that set them up for post secondary. And now mm -hmm. that I look at them, I'm like, wow, like so many of you probably have no idea what you want to do when you're older, but we're you know forcing you to pick your courses already. Yeah. Make those choices. Yeah. You know, I think that could be a good and bad thing because at least it gets them thinking about it. Because I agree, Tan, I wasn't thinking about what I wanted to do in university. I just wanted to play football. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? But at least um, yeah. now I think that they're forced to think about it. The only time I think I had to start thinking about what I wanted to do like, out of high school uh, was a provincial, the number of provincial exams I needed to take. Because at the time, certain universities would allow you to you know, apply with only three. And then right. I think certain ones had like UBC, you needed four and it right. kind of dictated where you ended up. So mm -hmm. anyway, again, I went the easy route. We were three. Typical <laughs> 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 um, football dude, right? But anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess, I guess let's talk about that a little bit um, in terms of, uh, you know, just athleticism and physical activity. I know you're an athlete, notwithstanding, um, you know, you having, you know, your, I guess, ap amputee. How do you, how do you, how do you even say it? What do you call it? Uh, yeah, I'm an amputee. Yeah. Yeah. Um, see, I don't even know how, to, why you would call it. Um, so I know you're an athlete outside of that. You do orange theory and you do things, but you play sledge hockey. Yes. Uh, although sledge that. hockey, sledge hockey is actually changed now to be called para ice hockey. Just oh, to okay. kind of fit in with the terminology of the Paralympics a little bit yeah. more. Yeah. So um, I would say I do play para ice hockey and I have played that at a, quite a high level and mm -hmm. then I'm also a runner as well right this I know because I see you running which I want to ask you about uh, about what you use to run but um talk to me about the how did you get into the pair ice hockey uh, playing did you play that when you were younger or was it something that you picked up you know a little bit later on well I had heard about it when I was younger but mm -hmm. I didn't know where the team trained out of or how to get involved um, and so I actually was working out, um, my old gym used to be She's Fit, and uh, there was this man at the front desk who was staring at me, and I was like, well, first of all, like, this is a female gym. What are um, you doing? <laughs> but I had to go to the front counter, yeah. and he was there, and he turned to me, and he was like, you know, you're an amputee, I coach BC's sledge hockey team, you have to come and try it and so then it made sense why he was staring at me <laughs> and uh, so he gave me the information and he gave me his number and that was just what I needed to feel comfortable mm -hmm. actually going um, uh, that was my in so mm -hmm. I did phone him up and I went to the very next practice and they were very welcoming uh, it was back in 2010 so it was actually just around when the Olympics and Paralympics were here mm -hmm. So I started practicing with the local team and 
in BC, we don't actually have a lot of para ice hockey players. So our local team has a whole range of abilities. There's some people that are, um, they have sort of a weak core. So I'm not going to say that they're beginner, but they just, they may not ever progress to be uh, an elite athlete in the sport. Right. Um, and then there's some that are the elite athletes and even have been on the Canadian men's team. So okay. we all practice together. And then out of that, every year they form a team representing BC okay. to send to various tournaments. Okay. Um, so anyways, I started playing with them and I found out that I was actually quite fast. <laughs> I just, I do have a really strong core so I can mm. move about really quickly and uh, so, you know, once you start gaining confidence in something, then you really want to keep doing it. So I, mm. I definitely progressed uh, at a very quick level. Quick That's level. really cool. And, and um, you mentioned core a couple of times, and it's obviously quite essential for everything that we do, but yeah. perhaps more particular in uh, pair ice hockey. Now, um, again, I haven't looked at a picture in a while, but essentially you're on, is it a sled with blades on the bottom? Is that how, is that what yes. you would consider it? Okay. Yeah. Sled with blades. And then the really good players have the blades extremely close together. I see. And then, uh, the people that are starting out or need more balanced support, then the blades are a little farther apart. Ah, interesting. So this is where the, uh, the core strength comes into play because yes. if you if you got blades that are part, much closer together, it'll tip over quite a bit. Yes, that's right. Um, but mm. it does allow you to turn much faster. Much faster. Okay. Yeah. So where are you in terms of width apart? Are you much closer? <laughs> I'm not the very closest. <laughs> uh, I probably could put them closer, but I'm, yeah. I'm pretty happy with my balance. So yeah. they are quite close together, but okay. not, and, not as much as the top people. <laughs> okay. Now, and then, then, so you have the sled um, and then you have the sticks. You have, you have two sticks. Is that correct? Yep, two little sticks, right. um, and there's a blade just like a regular hockey stick, and then at the other end, there are ice picks that we can okay. dig into the ice to move around. So under the back, like the back of your hand here, that's where the picks would be, so you can, that's what you use to propel yourself. Uh, yeah, right? so your hand would be at the, like the bottom of the hockey blade, right. and then the stick goes down, and then the ice picks are at the bottom of the stick. Oh, I see, yeah. I see. That's really cool. Now, um... You said you got to, I, and perhaps I got it incorrect, but uh, you got, you were playing at a high level for the province. Yeah. All right. So have you As well as the country. And for the country. Okay. Yes. So talk to me about that a little bit. So you were on the provincial team, but also on the national team. Yes. So um, one of the other girls on the team, our team in BC is mostly male, but there okay. were two of us females. And uh, she's actually from Ontario where the sport is much more developed. I see. And, um, there was a team in Ontario that was um, kind of calling itself Team Canada for okay. females because they weren't under Hockey Canada. Hockey Canada actually um, wouldn't create a female team. Okay. So these players started their own team. I see. And um, so right when I was first starting, um, you know, I'd been around, I think, for about six months. And my friend was like, oh, you should try out for Team Canada. I really think that you would make it and so anyways i did actually fly out there and i did make the team That's so and cool. um since then though the team has had so much growth actually um they got a new female coach and the assistant coach is actually a previous uh canadian men's paralympic team player okay. um and they are fully supported by hockey canada now um, the players are amazing. Um, and, you know, I, I would, would like to think that I'm still competitive at their level, but, you know, after having our third kid, I just, <laughs> I realized that my husband would not be too happy with me traveling, you know, every so often to, uh, to go to different tournaments, and mm. especially in different countries. So I, I haven't actually tried out for Team Canada for a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. um, BC, Team BC, I have still played for, but uh, yeah, Team Canada, it was, I was with them, I think for about five years it was wow. a really good experience that's really cool now did you play uh in any olympics or um what's the other one here pan am games uh, oh no that wouldn't make sense was there pan am uh, games paralympics would be um they oh, do okay. have like world championships so okay. okay yeah so basically the way it works is that there is no female paralympic um ice or sledge hockey team yet um okay. If you remember when women's stand-up hockey was first starting out and it was like Team Canada was really strong and Team mm -hmm. USA was really strong, but that was it. That was it. <laughs> um, they are finding that that same kind of thing is happening with para ice hockey. So 
they are aiming to be in the Paralympics uh, as, as soon as possible, but they're not quite there yet. So okay. in the meantime, though, we have been having world championships where uh, Team Canada and Team USA will play. And then there's also a team formed from different European countries. Okay. So they'll come together and form a third team. Now, when you were on the Canadian team, uh, what kind of uh, travel opportunities did it afford you? Like, did you go internationally and travel to, and play? Um, the years that I went, we competed mm. in either Canada or the United States. It was. Canada, um, but yeah. since then, they have actually had a tournament in the Czech Republic. I think that was right after I had my son. Um, so, yeah. So the, and then um, I can't remember if there was anything else, but they definitely are mm. expanding to uh, parts of Europe now right. to travel to. Right. That's really cool. Um, I mean, I've only seen like clips of, of games. And I think I said one time I'd try to watch one of your games when you, ha- you, you were still playing. But um, I, I just see it just so it seems so intense. <laughs> it is. <laughs> right. And in terms of speed and stuff, I think, I mean, it obviously requires a lot of core and upper body strength. But you're moving, I would probably say, just as quickly as uh, stand up hockey, would you say? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I haven't really put myself next to someone in a stand-up hockey game but for me it seems like super fast and you really have to get out of the way and mm-hmm. very quickly and you have to expect hits along the board yeah. people are competitive shots are hard mm-hmm. and it the is, physicality uh, of it too and it's full contact there's no there's no easing up on this thing. no that's right and <laughs> you know the women are a little different than the men but the mm. men especially just give it and there's really? lots of crunching and <laughs> Now, a question for you. Um, I know, uh, and perhaps maybe this was just for amateur or for recreation, but uh, like wheelchair basketball, as an example, Mm -hmm. um, can be played by both, um, you know, able and uh, disabled people. Is that right? Right. Um, Because you can sit on the chair. Um, Now, is that the same for uh, para ice hockey? Can someone who's able bodied, can they still play as well? Yes, they definitely can. So um, in Ontario, where my friend is from, they actually have lots of different teams. Mm -hmm. And many of the people on the teams are able-bodied because, you know, they kind of start off as the friend of somebody who's in a wheelchair (laughs) or an amputee. And then they play it and they're like, oh, this is so much fun. So, um, you know, they can't make it onto Team Canada. Right. But um, we actually, they can make it onto Team BC in BC just because we have such a, a small pool of players. I, see. Uh, I think in the other provinces, you do have to have some sort of disability, mm-hmm. but uh, we welcome able-bodied people. For sure. <laughs> right. The play. It just, again, it would just seem like really fun. Right. It is a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> um, so not only did you, do you play uh, para ice hockey, but like you said, you were a runner. And so this is how, of course, I, when I met you and I knew you of, um, a part of a component of the Orange Theory class is running. And um, so when you come to class, you use a specific prosthetic, right? Yes. And so I, I think I put it in the questions and I just, me doing a Google search was what it came up, but what is it called? So it's, um, it's got a flex foot and I don't know uh, if what brand of foot that is, but it's oh, okay. essentially, it looks like the same as what you would see in the Paralympic runners where it's curved. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there are different um, makes of it, but yes, that's the one. Uh, I actually have four legs in total. So that's oh, my specific one for running. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, well, let's talk, well, let's talk about this one first and you can tell me about the other ones because I guess there's <laughs> different purposes, right? Yep. At the end of the day. Um, so this one in particular, and um, um, I think it maybe got put into the spotlight. I'm sure you're familiar with who Oscar Pistorius is. Yes. Okay. And so yeah. I think he was the first person that um, I think globally brought this to light. I mean, notwithstanding certain legal things that he had done. <laughs> as, an, as an athlete, he was an incredible athlete. And people started to argue that, you know, should he be competing in, you know, not Paralympics, but also in just the regular Olympics? or vice versa. Mm-hmm. I can't remember which one it was. Um, and so he, I guess, popularized this flex foot. Um, so, and I don't know if it's different because you have one leg that you, you know, a leg that you don't need that on. Um, is it like, how does it feel? Like, is it bouncier than your, your other leg? Like, how does that feel? You know what I mean? Yes. I guess uh, it, it is really bouncy. So yeah. <laughs> when I first started running, I ran on my leg that I just use every day because okay. that's all we had for technology and um it was it's hard to land on I see. and in the end that foot ended up breaking uh, <laughs> at the ankle and it would just okay. start flopping around and then I would 
need to get a new foot. So okay. when I first bought this leg, I couldn't believe how light it was mm -hmm. and how uh, the bounce was and uh, it wasn't jarring. Like it really made a big difference for my running. Yeah, that's really cool. And I know you do long distance running. So tell me about that a little bit. Like you have the, you were signed up for up until recently, the BMO. <laughs> yeah, so right? I actually did the BMO last year. Yep. <laughs> Uh, and then I've, I've done another half marathon as well. So I, um, I was running about 10 K and in my head, I just had always thought, you know what, I'm not gonna be able to run longer than that because, uh, it's going to hurt. Um, and then I, I realized of course that there are long distance amputee runners. So I went to my prosthetist and I said, you know, I'm interested in running longer distances. Uh, do you think that that's something that's suitable for me? And then he said, yes. So, you know, he made me this leg for running. And um, I definitely, I don't think that I could do a marathon. Like I, for me in my training runs right around 16, 17 K, it finally has started feeling jarring when I land mm. and there is some pain uh, and soreness. Um, and so on race day, I, I haven't felt that just because I think you're just so hopped up on adrenaline, adrenaline and you're <laughs> in the zone. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think anything past 21K, I think would be a little bit too much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a really big goal of mine to be able to run a half marathon. So I was so excited when I was finally able to do that. That's so cool. What a, what a, what a, what a cool thing to be able to do. And to be honest with you, I, I still haven't run a half marathon yet. <laughs> So, well, you need to. <laughs> I know clearly. Um, the only endurance that I ever did uh, outside of, yeah, uh, really outside of any other sport that I played was uh, the 1500 in uh, elementary school. Oh, okay. And I yeah. won. And I won it. I got the, uh, was it the blue ribbon for first place? <laughs> Not even <laughs> a medal. <laughs> but uh, that, was, that was my uh, long distance um, career. And then uh, it all went a different, different direction from there. But um, so the psychology of long distance running is different right for mm -hmm. from any sport um so notwithstanding the challenges of you know how it feels when you're saying the limitation like pain and things that you feel even you know approaching that half half marathon mark um how do you uh, mentally or psychologically prepare yourself for something like that well for me uh thorough training was really important because mm. i i couldn't be someone who just was like oh i'm gonna run a half marathon tomorrow <laughs> yeah. um so yeah. i followed a training plan and i i felt confident um i think after in both of my runs i did a training run of 18k and i was mm. like okay if i can do 18 in my training i can make it to 21 in the real thing um so for me, that was key in having the confidence. And then mm -hmm. also for me, I like to listen to music while I run. Like I find it really helps um, sort of propel me and energize me. So I think that was a big part of it too. Mm -hmm. And then I also like, I, I don't want to brag, but when I am running in an actual race, I get a lot of comments from people. Oh, do you? Uh, yeah. Like even if it's just like a thumbs up or a you go girl, like it's yeah, yeah. There's lots of inspirational comments <laughs> to me along the way, which also right. really helps keep me motivated. For sure. That's really cool. Actually. Yeah. You never think about that. Um, and people are just kind of just, you know, uh, encouraging you even more so along the way. And, um, that's, yeah. that's really awesome. So what kind of music do you listen to? So now I'm asking more because for selfish reasons, because as a coach, you always want to have good music to motivate everybody. So yes. what kind of music do you listen to when you're, when you're running on your own and you're trying to, you know, prepare and all that stuff? Um, <laughs> I like a whole range of things. Like okay. actually right now, um, I'm kind of stuck listening to all my husband's music, like <laughs> rock songs from yeah, like yeah. the 90s, you know, um, right. that's stuck. what's I on there. But <laughs> <laughs> I think I really like, you know, like when a Backstreet Boys or NSYNC mm -hmm. or some cheesy 80s song comes on, that's right. when I'm like, oh, this is so good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can maybe sing along to it too, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. Okay, well, I'll keep that in mind as a coach anyway. I'll, uh, <laughs> um so let's talk about Mike for a second. And as you can see, that's his name on the, on the bottom uh, left corner there. It's not, you're not Mike. Uh, that's oh. your husband, Mike. So, so how did you two meet? Um, yeah, when did that all happen? Oh, well, um, so that's kind of a good story. Actually, um, <laughs> his mom taught at Elgin Park and uh, she was in the math department and um, she retired. And that was my 
first or second year that I was there and her retirement party was at the curling rink okay. in South Surrey. And of course her kids were there, including Mike mm-hmm. and I had never curled before. And it turns out that's one of the things I'm not very good at. <laughs> uh, and Mike had curled. So she put us on the same team mm-hmm. and he kind of gave me some tips. And then later on at the dinner, there was, I think there was like five of us that were under 30 or maybe even like under 40. So we all sat together and uh, him and I just connected and we, we chatted. And then um, after that, like, you know, we just kind of said goodbye. And Mm. I did like see her at work and I was kind of like, Oh, you know, I had a nice chat with your son, Mike. And I was like hoping she would, you know, I don't know, give me his number. Or something. Yeah, yeah. He didn't. Yeah. Um, but then he actually went onto the Elgin Park website and looked up my email address. No way. Yeah. And he, so he emailed me a week later. That's really cool. Well, yeah. I was going to say, Mike, come on, man. I didn't even ask for the number, like, <laughs> but he obviously still obviously felt the same way. It was mutual. And so he reached out and found you. Yes. That's really yes. cool. And so how long ago was that now? Uh, so we met in 2006. Yeah. Okay. So, and then we'll, this year is our 10th wedding anniversary in oh, August. You did it for what, four years? Three and a, yeah. Three and a half. Three and a yeah. That's really cool. Um, I love Mike, by the way, he's, he, <laughs> whenever I train him, like, um, so I knew he did classes at orange as well, but uh, at a different studio. Um, and so I know he'd already, and he runs with you. I know he likes running. So when he'd come in here to iron alley, that's what he would do. But, uh, in, in the sessions that him and I do together, he works so hard. Like he, mm-hmm. at a point where he's on the ground and I, now, now I'm going to call him out on it and he's going to hear <laughs> this, but he's on the floor, just like completely like exasperated and you know, he's out of, out of, you know, out of breath and everything. And he gets up a minute later and does it again. So he just works so hard and I, I love Mike so much. <laughs> so what was it about Mike then that, um, that, uh, I guess caught your eye or what was it that, uh, you know, made you think, okay, maybe I should get in touch with him again. Um, He's really smart. I think that's the first thing that drew me to him. Um, You know, like he knows math. So Mm. right away, (laughs) we had something in common. Mm. And, uh, you know, obviously, I thought he was cute as well. Um, (laughs) Yeah, and he just like, he was, he had such a wide variety of interests. Mm. um, That Like he was interested in music, and he plays instruments, and he's good at sports. And um, for me, I don't feel that I'm quite so well-rounded. So it was interesting to learn new things from him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Um, and I'm glad that you connected me with Mike because, um, yeah, he's, he's just a really, really cool guy to be around. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's really awesome. Um, so now you have three kids. Is that right? Three kids? Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay. So I've got one and he's not even one yet. And, um, I feel like my hands are full. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how, um, how has it been transitioning life to becoming a parent? Um, it's been interesting. Um, <laughs> you know, like I, I think for us, they're, they're all boys. So it's mm. definitely a high energy household. <laughs> and so, uh, that's been hard just where sometimes, you're like, you know what? We have to get outside. Otherwise, these children are going to tear the house apart. Mm-hmm. They just have so much energy. Um, I think the hardest thing for me was becoming a working mom. Mm. Like, I really don't think I'm cut out to be a stay-at-home mom. I just, I feel like I need my own interests and I need a side of myself away from home. Mm-hmm. Um, but I often find that I, I don't feel like I'm doing both very well. Like, I'm either going to, like, a great teacher and school's going amazing, but then something's <laughs> going wrong at home yeah, yeah. or vice versa. Yeah. So I found that to be the hardest part. I see. Now, um, this is one thing I hear about and uh, my wife, Misha, she was in school to be a teacher and then uh, changed her path to counseling. And now she's a personal trainer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, that was her original path. But then a lot of the feedback that she would get from other teachers and perhaps you don't feel the same way is that, man, like, I don't know if I want to hang out with my own kids after hanging out with all these kids all day at, for my work. So <laughs> how do you feel? Where are you on that spectrum? of? Okay. <laughs> I'm okay right now yeah. because they're not teenagers yet. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> I, th- I think once I teach teenagers and I have teenagers at home, then mm-hmm. that's going to be a lot of sameness. Yeah, <laughs> that's um, true. That's I do, true. however, feel like the listening mm-hmm. really bugs me because – you know, at home, I have to say something five times before one of them mm. actually follows 
like my direction. Right. And then I go and teach high school students and same thing. And I was so a lot say. of times it's like, listen, you know, I'm not speaking to hear myself talk. Right, right. I'd like you guys to listen. So that yeah, is one yeah. thing that I have that drives me nuts. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, I thought, and, and when you when you were saying that, I was like, yeah, when you come home, you got to tell your kids to do things five times. But in high school, it's probably like 10 or 20 times, right? <laughs> Depends. <laughs> yeah. Depends. I mean, I remember as a student how I was. So um, I wasn't necessarily the easiest student either. <laughs> Um, no, so how and um, who are they? Like you have three boys. How old are they, and what are the names? So I have a seven-year-old named Rory, and then uh, our other son Kit is going to be five in May, and then our youngest is Hudson, and he's two and a half. Two and a half. Okay, so everybody's running around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, Cruz isn't walking quite yet. Uh, and um, I guess I'm really in no rush to get him walking. I mean, he, eventually it's going to get to a point where, you know, he should be walking, I think. But um, I, from what I hear anyway, as soon as they're that mobile, you know, we're in real trouble. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I remember actually Rory was walking at 10 months and I wow. was like, I wasn't expecting this to happen so soon. And yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's definitely a whole new world, but mm -hmm. it, it is fun because then, you know, walks are a lot more interesting for them when they're not stuck in the stroller. And right. They can participate more. That's so true. So uh, you can answer this or not. Um, are we done with the three, uh, three boys or is there plans for more potentially? Uh, we're not sure. Okay. We would really like a daughter. Gotcha. Gotcha. I don't quite know how to acquire that daughter. <laughs> <laughs> how do we acquire it? I love how you put yeah. that. <laughs> Um, so interesting about daughters. Uh, so Misha would like a daughter. I mean, I certainly, I'm kind of on the fence, I'll be honest. And <laughs> the only reason I say that is because again, growing up, um, my sister is eight years younger. I like telling this story, but she's eight, year, eight years younger than me. And we kind of grew up in a single, uh, parent, uh, home. So my mom kind of raised us, but then I was this, I guess I had to play this older brother slash father figure. And I was a very protective older brother. And so we laugh about it now, my sister and I, because you know, Kevin never let me go to high school dances and da, da 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 I could never meet boys. I'm like, well, look who you ended up with now. She's got two kids and she's very happy with who she's, you know, her husband now. But point is, um, I don't know how I would deal with it, you know, had I had a, if, I, if we had a daughter and then, you know, having to deal with guys like me in high school. <laughs> I know. Yeah. That's my challenge, right? <laughs> So. Yeah, it's, uh, I have heard that it's, it's hard to raise sons in the beginning, but mm. then later on, it's it a lot off. easier. Than <laughs> and level of difficulty. Now, if yeah. you, and um, um, I was, tell, whenever I tell the story about Cruz, and I just kind of, when I'm com comparing with other par new parents that have kids about my age, uh, Cruz's age, um, I always say, man, I feel like we locked out, like if we, we could have bought him off of a, you know, a shelf. At Toys R Us, we picked like the beginner version of, you know, of becoming a parent. You know what I mean? Because he's just, yeah. I don't know, like he's just, he's, he fight, figured out how to sleep well. He eats well, like he sleeps through the night, things like that. And I feel like we got really lucky. So if you could uh, rate your kids from beginner to advanced, uh, starting with <laughs> Rory Hudson and Kip, Rory yes. Kip and Hudson. Kip, so yeah. which one is like beginner to advanced in terms of parenting? Could you rank them? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Kit's probably the easiest one. Okay. Um, he he was a hard baby to get to sleep. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, like he's our best listener. Mm. Uh, he so far seems very bright. Mm -hmm. um, Hudson is our worst toddler for sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he was an amazing baby, and then yeah, yeah right around two was uh, when it all went downhill. Mm. Um, and then Rory is, uh, he's very bright, Yeah. but he, he was the one where when his new brother came along, he was not happy. Oh no. And I always say if he, like, if someone was meant to be an only child, that's him. Like, that he was him, eh? yeah, he still doesn't like to share his things and oh, he boy. does like to play, but, uh, not all the time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, they're, they're all challenging in their own way, but yeah, know. definitely. I guess we're lucky that the eldest is probably the most problematic. Since <laughs> the other two seem a little bit easier. <laughs> yeah, no, that's really interesting. And perhaps the dynamic is, I guess, amplified because they're three boys. And, you yes. know, I guess they have those, you know, male hormones, you know, as they grow up, it will kind of, you know, maybe they'll butt heads a lot more, perhaps. 
Yeah, they, grow they already really like to wrestle. Like, oh, do they? Uh, and Mike has a brother, so I just look at him. I'm like, "Were you and Scott like this?" And he's like, "Yeah, just yeah. get used to it." Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so having the daughter perhaps will change the dy dynamics of things. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. So we'll see what happens with us. Um, yeah. So I think I'm on the fence. Nisha's like, "Okay, no, we definitely have need to have a girl." So we'll see what happens there. <laughs> yeah. So I want to ask you a few other questions. I want to, you know, learn a little bit more about you and not just about, you know, your, you know, your uh, prosthetic and, um, you know, about your, your teaching career and things like that. Um, here's a few questions. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, okay. If you met your younger self today, what would make them happy or sad about you? Um, I think my younger self would be really happy to see that I was married mm -hmm. with kids because there definitely were times when I was younger where I didn't envision that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think maybe they would be a little bit sad to see that I haven't had a whole ton of life experience. Mm -hmm. Like I went straight from high school to university to teaching. I didn't, I still haven't traveled that much, mm -hmm. you know, um, I definitely have like a nine to five type of a life. So yeah. there are, are other lives that seem so much more cultured or sometimes, you know, exciting, I guess. You right. Say. Right. So I'm sure you know the term FOMO. Yes. You know <laughs> yeah. So do you, do you feel in a way because you feel that, um, do you feel a bit of FOMO with certain things? If, if you, if you will, like if you would call it that, or is it just kind of like, well, maybe one day. I think it's more maybe one day. Like yeah. uh, looking back, I would, potentially have tried to travel more in my summers between university or, you know, like even maybe done a semester abroad, like just something different like that. But I certainly know that in the future, if I want to travel, I can. And if mm. I want to learn something new, I can do that. It's just at this time in my life, I'm not really able to do right. those things. Yeah. Well, the kids change a lot of, a lot of things, right? Priorities change very quickly once you have kids. Yes. That was Mike. Is uh, does Mike have kind of the similar plans? Like, he would he want to travel and things too? Perhaps you know when you know you guys are empty nesters. I think Mike would like to get a condo in Vegas. Oh no way! <laughs> he fun. he likes to play poker, so yeah. I think um, if we were to have like a vacation property or something, yeah, he'd love to just be able to pop down to the Bellagio for some poker if he wanted yeah, to. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, and plus, flights are cheap, right? Well, I don't know right now. <laughs> yeah. but I mean, when I went down there once, um, I mean, those were one of the cheapest flights to get to Vegas. Yes. Yeah. It's not that expensive. Right? So that's really cool. Okay. Um, what, I guess, and perhaps and you maybe answer that question, but uh, what is something you think everyone should experience in their lifetime? Well, um, I guess this would apply to only half of the population, but for me, um, yeah. giving birth, was actually yeah. like a major yeah. highlight of my yeah. life. Okay. Um, and so like, <laughs> you just can't do it, unfortunately, but um, <laughs> for anyone who's able to and, and is interested like that, to me, that was really empowering. Mm -hmm. So it was the empowering aspect of having a child. Yes. And just like um, being able to like, I guess, nourish something with my body. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's like, it's there. And I'm the one who was able to bring it into the world and just also right. just going through all the pain of that process as well it makes you feel mm -hmm. really strong yeah that's really interesting actually would you say then i mean of the three kids that you the three boys uh did you enjoy the pregnancies and then the childbirth or because i know I mean, especially for my wife she's like you know i kind of didn't really like the pregnancy part the childbirth part was relatively easy so was there like you know how did you feel about that um i didn't love being pregnant particularly no. yeah. um you know there's like when the baby kicks and stuff, that's exciting, but yeah. it's really a long time. And, yeah. you know, like you don't sleep well and you don't, don't get to drink and it's, yeah, right. you know. <laughs> it limits a lot of things that I want to do. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, with, um, with Rory, I had an epidural, but then with our other two, I did not. And, okay. um, both of those births were like super fast okay. and I have a pretty high pain tolerance, so I wouldn't say it was overly painful. So, uh, like it definitely was painful, but not crazy. Um, yeah. So yeah, both both of those times, I was like, I could do this again. This wasn't mm -hmm. that bad. Yeah, and I think I think that that speaks a lot. I mean, obviously, again, I can't empathize, but uh, I do know people who have said, you know, I don't know if I want to have kids, and they're kind of on the fence about it. But here you are saying it's a very empowering experience. 
Um, yes, but also I wouldn't ever say, you know, if you don't have kids, oh, yeah. Just, yeah, just don't <laughs> right. do it, right? Like yeah, yeah, not yeah. everybody has to have them. For yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. <laughs> not really, yeah, and I, and I love that perspective that you have on it. Um, here's an interesting one. If you could fix one problem, what would it be? Um, like one problem in the world or? You're, yes. you, you get to interpret this one however way you like. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, it could be a macro problem. It could be, uh, you know, a very micro Tia problem. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, in, a, in Tia world, I would probably want a house with a bigger backyard. That yeah. would be a problem that I would want to fix. <laughs> there you go. There you go. We live in a nice house, but it's on the newer side, and those new houses don't come with big backyards. Big yards, yeah. And I, yeah. That's, and I love that you say that. I mean, we're hoping for a big yard with this place that we're looking at. So, I mean, um, that's the goal anyway. Uh, we get that yeah. big yard. Okay. If your home was on fire and you had only time to grab three things – of course, your family comes first. They always come. They don't, they don't count. Okay. <laughs> you got to bring them all, and that's four things, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, outside of your family, if you could grab three things from your house, uh, what would those three things be? Um, well, it depends. If it's at nighttime, I don't sleep with my leg on, so I would definitely want to bring my leg. That's important, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, I guess uh, – some sort of technology like my phone or my mm. husband's phone um or a communication or something right yeah some sort of communication <laughs> yeah. and um if i guess maybe wallet. wallet i was gonna say like a photo album or something but really like these days there's so much on social media anyway mm -hmm. like they're a lot yeah, of right. so yeah some sort of like important um documents I guess. gotcha all right um, oh, we never talked about that, actually. I want to ask you, because you said that you had four different types of legs. Uh, <laughs> I know of two of them. Well, one of them. Can you tell me a little bit more about the other ones and what other functions they serve? Okay, so I have one leg that's my everyday leg. So right. that one has like a foam shell and I have a nylon on it. So that's what I wear to work. Looks I see. pretty normal. Um, then my running leg which we've talked about. Um, mm. I do have one for swimming. Um, okay. So some amputees choose to just swim without a leg, but I've always been too self-conscious for that. So mm. the swimming leg just essentially looks like a big metal pole. It's not very exciting, but okay. you know, it does the job. Okay. And then I have another one for working out that has a proper foot that I can okay. wear a running shoe with. Um, and that's for more of like a, an exercise class or something where – I'm not focusing on running. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I actually had that one first before my running leg. Okay. Um, and then when I wanted to do more running, that's when they built my running leg. For me. I see. So I, I guess, uh, so when you, were you already doing orange theory classes when you had the, uh, your first uh, working out leg? No, I always, I've had my running leg for the whole time, uh, oh, but okay. I did actually try the other leg um, a couple times because with the rowing machine, that leg yeah. is actually better because I can. Put, some knee flexion <laughs> stuff, right? Yeah, I can put both feet uh, in the straps, mm. um, but then for the treadmill, it's worse. So I, I, I made a judgment call and I was like, you know what? When I'm on the rower, I'll just row with one leg and then right. the treadmill will be way better. Right, right. Bit of a compromise that you had to make. <laughs> no, and, that's, and honestly, I find it so fascinating that, um, you know, the, the technology that, you know, they, they have nowadays to, to make things, you know, efficient or for you to be able to do that. Oh, yeah. Um, it's right? so different from being born in the 80s to now. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so much better. Is there anything else, I guess, before we move on, is there anything else now that they've come in terms of advances uh, for prosthetics and things that um, beyond even just the running leg? Well, you know, it's hard to say because I know for sure for um, arm amputees, mm -hmm. like they have like arms that can actually communicate with your body and like articulation. And open. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. the hands can articulate. So, um, I would say, yes, there's I some see. pretty amazing advances for me. I think I'm kind of tapped out with, with what, <laughs> what yeah. they can do for me right now, I see. but I see. probably in the future, there'll be even more cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's really cool. Okay. Um, complete this sentence. If you really, really, really knew me, Tia Hill, you would know that. Ooh. <laughs> I am not always happy for other people. <laughs> oh, no way. That's, that's interesting. <laughs> yes. Can you elaborate? Um, yeah, it's, it's hard to explain. I guess I've always just been a little bit on the jealous side. Mm. So um, if someone has good news and it's maybe like something that 
I have personally wanted for myself. Mm. I will, on the surface, I will appear to be very happy for them. <laughs> yeah. But inside, I'll be like, you know, worried. Okay, I haven't done this yet, mm. or I don't have this. And like, I, it's not a becoming feature. So like, most people wouldn't know it about me. But mm. like, I think it was last year, that was my New Year's resolution was to be happier for other people. So it's like something I'm working happier? on. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, yeah, <laughs> you know, and I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, that's probably something that a lot of people maybe wouldn't admit about themselves or even, you know, know, right. Having, you know, that self um, awareness. Um, mm-hmm. And I guess just kind of my reflection for myself and trying to empathize with that. I, I can, I can totally understand that, that emotion because the, it just, ref, it just kind of reflects back on, okay, well, you know, where am I in my personal growth or in my development, yeah. you know, and it kind of just like, Oh man, so-and-so is doing this and, you know, why aren't I there? And um, for me, it was a lot of uh, the age thing. Like someone mm. who's younger than me accomplishing more than I had right. at that point. Yeah. Um, it became a very big um, kind of mental barrier for me. And it takes time, right? It takes time for you to, to get past that. And yes. the, honestly, it was a lot of, um, I, I employed the, the ignorance is bliss <laughs> um, um, tactic. And really it's worked because at the end of the day, and you know, you read all these books and things. And one of the quotes that always stand out, stands out to me, um, I don't know if you know who uh, John Wooden is, but he was a legendary basketball coach in uh, UCLA uh, many years ago. Anyway, so uh, he had written a book that was actually given to me by a mentor and uh, he, one of the main quotes that really stood out to me was, um, you know, stop looking at the scoreboard. And again, really looking back again uh, in basketball terms, because we get so caught up in thinking and looking at other people's accomplishments and where they're at. And then we start, we stop, we forget about, you know, the things that we can do to improve ourselves. Exactly. Right. And I was totally at that in this, you know, obsessive state of, Oh, what are they doing? And especially now with social media, I think it's that much easier to always be in tune with what everyone else is up to. And of course, Instagram is everyone's highlight reel, right? Yeah. <laughs> for, the part, for the most part. I know there's some, there's some real people that post, you know, some tougher things on there, but um, it really is. And so you kind of, I just kind of said, you know what, I'm just going to close my eyes and put blinders on the things that aren't making me feel so good and uh, focus on what I can do. And it really has just not only just improved my mood and just my esteem, but I think I've, it's given me the chance to just really focus on myself and don't think about anyone else. So. That's really, no. that's really good advice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, if I was advice, I mean, I didn't really mean it for to be that way, but <laughs> it was just something that I, that I felt that had worked for me so well, because yeah. I really, honestly, I struggled with it for many years as well, Ch- especially because I was changing careers and it's almost like starting from day one every single right. time. Right. Yeah. And so, so no, I appreciate that. Um, this one, um, what in your life do you feel is a work in progress right now? Uh, Well, I think I kind of mentioned it earlier, but I would say parenting. Um, You know, there's, I guess there's parenting books, but I don't have time to read those. Yeah, right. right. So (laughs) I I always feel like uh, I'm dropping the ball on something or if Mm. there's a better way to handle something, um, you know, but uh, we're trying our best, which is the main thing. Yeah. And I I, I would say that to every parent. And I mean, again, I'm, I'm a rookie at being a parent, but I think we all figured out and you know, you, you look back at your parents, you say, Oh man, why, why was my mom like that? Or why was my dad like that? But you know, they did the best that they could do with information that they had. And that's all you can do as a parent, because yeah. especially for me, I was an older child. I was the, old, the eldest and I was really the Guinea pig for <laughs> any parenting thing that had yes. to happen. Right. Yeah, so, me too. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, you know, it's kind of just trial and error and we do our, you know, the best, if you're a good person and you instill good values into your kids, what else could you do? Right. I yeah. think that's really what it comes down to. Um, at least that's my goal anyway. <laughs> um, what are you most proud of uh, in your life that um, perhaps most people wouldn't really know about? Um, when I was, or when I started my master's degree, mm-hmm. we were trying to have our first baby, but it was taking a long time. So I was like, well, I want something else to look forward to. So I applied to UBC and then found out that I was pregnant shortly after. Oh, no way. Um, and so I tried to see if I could defer my mm-hmm. master's and they said, no, you'd have to reapply next year. So I decided to just still do it. Mm-hmm. So I started it when I was pregnant and it took me about four years to finish it. Wow. Well, uh, growing our family and working and I, um, I w- started back when my son was four months old. So 
Oh my I would gosh. like brought my breast pump with me to class <laughs> and, oh you goodness. know, would pump in the brakes and stuff. And so, um, finally I got my master's and I was really just so proud of myself for sticking with it. Yeah. It took a long time. And, um, you know, so most people, they don't really know like all the backstory behind yeah. that. So yeah. it really meant a lot to me to be able to finish. No, and I appreciate that. And, and, and obviously congratulations for pushing through. Obviously that's, you know, be, being a new parent in itself is a challenging thing. And to have those two kind of coincide and for you to continue mm-hmm. to do it. Cause I know a lot, a lot of people are just like, okay, you know what? I'm just, I'm just going to focus on this. Yeah. Right? And um, I can say, you know, uh, my wife kind of experienced some, a similar thing. Uh, we found out that we were having a baby and she was in her last year of her undergrad. Oh. Um, and so she had to fit, you know, power through it and make sure that, you know, obviously she finished and she did. And it was really cool because, uh, during the convocation, uh, you know, we got to have the little one there. <laughs> so it was just really cool. Um, yeah. to see, but I mean, that's so awesome that you were able to push through. Um, anything that you're most excited about right now, because I know you were looking forward to the BMO and doing the relay. You were telling me about that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, this, the way that life is going right now, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what to be excited about exactly. Yeah. I guess excited for the summertime when maybe we can actually go outside and spend time with family again. Right. So I think for me, like work-wise with mm-hmm. the bringing on the online learning, I'm, I'm a little bit excited about that just because it feels like I finally have time to learn about it and yeah. investigate. So yeah. that's one thing. But yeah, really, it's just hoping that all of this COVID-19 stuff um, gets yeah. under control. And, yeah, and we then can I'll all start making on. plans again. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess in a way this is kind of practice for you because we're doing this Zoom calls and things. Um, you know, this is a platform that perhaps you'll be using for this online education. Yes, yeah, exactly. This is one of the choices. Okay, now question, I guess, for you, and you know, going off script a little bit, but um, what do you, where do you see uh, education going, knowing now what we know and you know the limitations we have physically? distancing one another and of course classrooms are always you know more compact um now that we have these we're kind of forced into this online learning platform or doing things virtually how do you see education going forward from this what can we take away i think it depends on how long this goes on for Mm -hmm. but i think a lot of teachers are going to get some new ideas Mm -hmm. and i think communication wise there are a lot of teachers that already communicate with students online and students have online portfolios but um certainly in math we don't do that as much right so it could almost be that um in a sense teachers may end up being more facilitators and like you know um the students may be more responsible for learning it on their own and then we're there for support or Mm -hmm. we could even try something called the flipped classroom where we would um record a lesson ahead of time for students to watch at home. And then when they come to school, it could be more of a tutorial session. So That's really cool. Yeah. I think this would open, will open up a lot more um, teaching opportunities for mm-hmm. teachers. Wow. I, you know, if you, going back now, if you were to think when you were a student in element or high school, would you do better as a student now or back when you were a student in high school, like the way you, people can learn now? Cause I think I would do much better, uh, now just because the way that you know the resources that we have and things like that Mm -hmm. i think for sure it would have been helpful to have uh the internet back then (laughs) or at least so many so many things on the internet um but i think i personally like um having someone who's holding me accountable Mm -hmm. so i think like a full online learning style wouldn't work for me Mm -hmm. but certainly it's so easy to communicate with a teacher now. Um, and like, if I had a question as a student, I could just email them at night. Yeah. So I, I think I would be just as successful these days as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's just because you I think you were a good student. Whereas yeah. I wasn't. <laughs> okay. I got a few easy uh, one worders for you. Okay. okay. Uh, how do you like your eggs? Um, scrambled. Scrambled. Okay. Uh, winter, spring, summer, or fall? Spring. Spring. Okay, which is kind of right now, but not right now because <laughs> of what's <laughs> happening. Uh, squat, bench, or deadlift? If you could choose one of the three, because we're in a powerlifting gym, and that's why I like to ask. Squat. Squat. Okay. Uh, no context to this one. Uh, fast or slow? <laughs> slow. <laughs> okay. Uh, sweet or savory? Sweet. Sweet. 
and crunchy or smooth? Crunchy. Crunchy. Oh man, really? Yeah. I, I, I love I love this question because it's such a you know divided you know thing. Because I'm on the it smooth is. boat, and then people are on the crunchy boat. So what about Mike? Is he a crunchy peanut he, butter? No, he's smooth. Oh, okay. So you got to get two jars of peanut butter at home. Yeah, we do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and like ice cream, he doesn't like anything chewy in his ice cream. This has got to be smooth, whatever like flavor it is. There's no chunks or anything like that. Yeah. That's funny. That's so interesting. Okay, I'm going to give him <laughs> a hard time about that. Um, next time <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, before we get to our final questions here, um, how can people kind of get in touch with you, whether it's on Instagram or Facebook? Is there a way people can get in touch with you? Um, yeah, I'm on Instagram. I'm Tia V Hill. Uh, obviously, Tia spelled T-H-E-A, I like Thea. So um, that's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Cool. And uh, can, can students find you there too? <laughs> Uh, they can find me there. <laughs> I don't I know, know if I'll just, respond to them. But. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. I'm just curious because I know like uh, some teachers that I know, they like come up with some convoluted uh, social media names so that their students can't find them. Oh, right. Yes, I know. <laughs> I know some of those. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, I'm going to put all those, your, your Instagram on the show notes so people can just click and uh, you know, follow you if they have any, if they want to get in touch with you. All right. Great. Okay. Um, here are your final questions. If you had the world's attention right now for 30 seconds on this podcast, what would you say? Well, given the way the world is right now, yeah. I would tell everybody to stay home, mm. really make an effort with the social distancing, uh, try getting together virtually, but in order for us to stop this thing, we need to be taking it seriously and just staying away from other people. Got it. Got it. Abide by the rules right now. It's important to save people's lives, right? Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Uh, your second to last question. I know we talked about the original second to last question, <laughs> but we're going to change it. It's a tough one. Um, so more of a fun one then. Um, if you could be famous for something, what would that thing be? If you could be just a famous celebrity, what would Ooh. you be famous for? Um, can I, like, does it have to be something I actually can do or? No, it could be anything. <laughs> anything you want. You know what? Honestly, I, I really enjoy working out and being athletic and, yeah. and even just working out with people. So I would like to be famous for being probably an amputee runner, I'd say. Mm. I don't think they have long distance running in the Paralympics. And if they did, it would be something I would be investing would excel sure. yeah oh that's really cool and now i feel like i'm gonna i want to look into that now because that's so interesting yeah and, and this is what you do so hmm. well maybe you still can be <laughs> <Maybe>. <laughs> <laughs> all right um here um before we get to our final question uh, Tia, uh i want to acknowledge you firstly because um first of all thank you for coming on and uh, sharing your story um it's opened my eyes certainly um obviously like i'm i even struggled with communicating about um, the, even the correct terminology for uh, you being an amputee. And uh, it's certainly a more of a learning uh, experience for me um, and, uh, you know, how I can empathize. And so I appreciate you sharing your story. And now I know, you know, your, you know, your life and how you've grown up and, um, you know, being the strong person that you are now. So thank you for telling your story. Oh, well, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, here is your final question. Now, what is your definition of living your best and fittest life? I would say do everything in moderation. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely take the time to be active. And it doesn't have to be just um, specializing in one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it could even just be, you know, going for long walks every day. But just find something that um, you enjoy and keeps you healthy. I personally really like it to involve fresh air. Like I find mm -hmm. that that invigorates me um certainly no smoking um mm -hmm. that's a big thing for me um <laughs> and then also just you know if you want to have a cheeseburger one day or if you want to have a couple glasses of wine like don't worry about it right mm -hmm. um but just don't uh go crazy with that right. sort of thing and i guess Everything finally would be to just surround yourself with a good network of people because part of being healthy is having a good support system and having people around you that make you feel good about yourself and and uh where you know that you have the support of and love of people if you need it mm -hmm. i love that i love that and i think that's so true um, um whether you're an extrovert or introvert i think it's so important to have you know people whether it's friends or family to have that support network around you mm -hmm. and even now it's kind of a challenging time 
but we have these mediums now that we can stay in touch. And I'm so glad that we were able to connect again today. It's been yes, me too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. My virtual hug. Virtual hug. Yeah. <laughs> so thanks again for uh, joining me. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, this episode will come out in a few weeks. And now that we did it on video, um, it'll be on YouTube now too. Oh, Woo-hoo. awesome. Well, great. Thank you so much for having me, Kevin. It You're was welcome. really fun. It was fun. Good catching up. And uh, hopefully we'll see each other soon. Okay. Sounds good. Bye. Bye. <laughs>